A city like this is a busy place. People rush to and fro, going about their daily lives. Do they ever stop to think about how that city started, or that it started at all? This is the city of Hobart. Little more than 200 years ago, it didn't even exist. That's hard to imagine when you look at the city today. But every town or city has a beginning, and Hobart's beginning was not so very long ago. Most of the evidence of earliest settlement is long gone. Not surprising when you consider that dwellings were just tents or rough structures made of sticks and mud. But by looking beneath the roads and the buildings, we can use our imagination and see what happened there before. This is the Tasman Fountain, and it can be found here at Salamanca Place. It commemorates an important event White men saw the land where Hobart now is, long before the British came here. Back in 1642, the Dutchman Abel Tasman arrived here with his ships, the Heemskirk and the Zeeën, and claimed it for the Dutch. But he saw little of value and continued on his way to New Zealand. Tasman's voyage was important for one particular reason, the naming of the island, although he didn't know it was an island at the time. He called it Van Diemen's Land, after his boss, General Anthony Van Diemen, the governor of Batavia. Uh, that's the city we now call Jakarta. In 1856, Queen Victoria renamed it Tasmania, to commemorate this earliest explorer. Following Tasman's brief visit, there were various other expeditions and landings, but none attempted to establish a permanent settlement. What was it that sent the British all the way across the waters of Bass Strait to Van Diemen's Land? Well, in 1802, a French scientific expedition was on its way to the Great Southern Land. And this made the English nervous that the French would stake a claim to Van Diemen's Land and thereby make control of the recently discovered Bass Strait difficult. Furthermore, increasing numbers of convicts were being shipped out to Port Jackson and Governor King of New South Wales was keen to find another place where they could be put. Late in 1803, King sent two ships, the Ocean and this one, a brig, the Lady Nelson, on a voyage to establish a new penal settlement close to where Sorrento in Victoria now is, or Port Phillip as it was called then. Well, this isn't the actual ship. This is a replica of the Lady Nelson. She usually ties up here at Franklin Wharf, and you can book at this office to take tours. You can even sleep on board for longer voyages. The Lady Nelson was a busy little ship. Just a few months earlier, she and another vessel, the Albion, sailed to Van Diemen's Land with 49 passengers, made up of convicts, soldiers, and a few free settlers. Lieutenant John Bowen was charged by King with starting a new settlement. This is the Bowen Bridge, named after the lieutenant, that connects part of Hobart to the eastern shore of the Derwent. The bridge ends at Risdon Cove. Back then, there were no bridges spanning the Derwent, so it was quite isolated. Meanwhile, back at Port Phillip, Collins decided that location was no good for a penal settlement, and he got permission to go across to Van Diemen's land and join Bowen. He arrived early in 1804 and described Bowen's party as being in a most wretched state, almost approaching starvation. He quickly decided that this location was no place for a settlement and he moved across the Derwent to the other side of the river to where Hobart now stands. One of the reasons Collins rejects site 
was because he considered this water supply too small to support the expanded party. The other problem was that this entrance was very shallow, only safe for ships at high tide. Risdon Cove now forms part of the city of Hobart. The zinc factory dominates this part of the bay on the other side of the Derwent, but otherwise there's little evidence of urban development. This part of Risdon Cove, a short distance from the Bowen Bridge, is called Bowen Park. The land was handed back to the Aborigine in 1995. These meeting rooms, known locally as the Pyramids, were built by the Tasmanian government in 1970 and are on the land that was returned to the Aboriginal community. This memorial to Bowen is in the grounds. The returned land includes this hill that's significant for a tragic event that soured relations between the settlers and the indigenous population. Relations between the settlers and the Aborigines have been quite friendly until one day a large group of Aborigines, including men, women and children, were seen moving down this hill towards the settlement. They were probably herding kangaroos towards a spot where they could be killed. But the settlers thought they were under attack and fired on the Aborigines, killing some of them, including women and children. Well, as you can imagine, after that event, the Aborigines were hostile to the settlers. And that's another reason why the Risdon Cove development was abandoned. Collins landed on the beach on the other side of the river. And here's a bit of historical trivia. As the Act of Union wasn't proclaimed until 1801, it's extremely unlikely that Collins had the new Union flag on board. It was probably this flag, Queen Anne's flag, that was raised. I'm standing at that approximate spot. As you can see, it's not a beach now. The land was gradually reclaimed to Formba. All the land from Macquarie Street across Davy Street to the water used to be part of the estuary. He named the new settlement Hobart Town after the Secretary of State for the Colonies at the time. Most of the people who landed at Sullivan's Cove were convicts or soldiers, but there were also a few free settlers and their families who hoped to make their fortunes in the new colony. Now, I want to show you one of the key reasons why this site was chosen for a settlement, a supply of fresh water. This is the Hobart Town Rivulet, and it was one of the key reasons Collins chose this spot for a settlement. It was cased in concrete back then. It was described as being beset with brushwood and prostrate trees, which often obstructed its course, thus forming pools and marshes. This part of the stream that runs behind the Cascade Brewery is probably closer to how it looked back then. Imagine drinking something like this. That's what the early settlers had to do. Although the rivulet was the main water supply for the town, the water soon became polluted with human and animal waste, and at some times of the year it would suddenly flood with quite disastrous consequences. Today the rivulet passes underground close to Liverpool Street. It all runs here, close to the Cat and Fiddle Arcade, past here at Murray Street between Collins and Liverpool Streets. It used to flow under here, where the City Hall is now, and then finally into the Derwent, here, near where the Zero Davy building now stands. In 1824, a diversion moved the stream to run parallel to Collins Street, here, close to the junction of Collins and Argyle Streets, past the hospital, where you can still above ground, and past Mall Hill, where the cenotaph stands. And into the estuary here, just behind the sewage works and the railway. The diversion was called the New Cut, and it used to be open, but gradually parts of it got covered over. I'm standing on Hunter's Island, I know it doesn't look much like an island now, but back in 1804, it was a small island connected to the mainland by a sandbar. This picture from 1804 gives you an idea of how it used to look. 
The advantage of having an island close to the main settlement was that it was a relatively secure place that could be used for stores. The very first buildings constructed in Hobart town would have been built here on this site to keep stores and weapons. It's hard to see what it used to be like because today it's covered with buildings and connected to the main island by Hunter Street. This causeway now carries Hunter Street was built in 1820. And this is close to where Hobart's first dwelling was built. It was a hut that was used to house convicts whose job it was to row across to the island to collect stores. And it didn't look anything like this. This used to be a beach and now it's where Evans and Macquarie Street meet. The rivulet water supply used to run next to here and so it was where most people set up their tents to get easy access to drinking water. Quite soon, Newtown, or Newton, about four kilometres from home centre, became a place of residence for officers and other free members of the expedition. Newtown is now part of Greater Hobart. This is Franklin Square, and it was where a crude three-roomed hut was erected as the first government house. For some months, Collins had made do with a tent, so it was progress of sorts. When Governor Macquarie visited in 1811, however, he was not impressed and insisted a new one be built. Macquarie picked out a site for the new government house here, where Macquarie Street meets Elizabeth Street, on the site where the town hall is now located. The Franklin Square barracks were the second to be erected. The first were placed where this building at 119 Macquarie Street now stands. This plaque was placed on the building to commemorate the centenary of that event. Governor Macquarie selected the site for new enlarged barracks during his visit in 1811. The Anglesey Barracks, named after the Master General of Ordnance in England, the Marquis of Anglesey, are the oldest continuously occupied barracks still in use in Australia. In this rich country we take food for granted. If we want food, we just go out and buy it. Back then, for the first white settlers, it wasn't so simple. The new settlement had to rely on supplies of food brought by ship from the mainland, supplemented by what they could grow. In 1806, and short, and the camp had to be put on half rations. In the same year, the wheat crop failed, and a huge flood swept away most of the other crops. In a decision that was to have significant consequences for the settlement and for the Aboriginal population, Prisoners were free to enable them to hunt for kangaroo and other food, and some of them took the opportunity to escape into the bush. The escaped convicts were bushranger gangs, stealing crops and killing Aborigines, sometimes for their food, sometimes for sport, and sometimes for the women. This problem with lawless gangs lasted well into the 1820s and it not only made the development of hope more difficult than it needed to be, but also destroyed any chance of reconciliation with the indigenous population. Between 1807 and 1808, over 550 settlers many of whom were ex-convicts, arrived from Norfolk Island, which was being closed down as a settlement, much to the dismay of many of the long-time residents of that island. Somewhat pacified by larger-than-usual government land and stock grants, they established farms at Rokeby, on the Risdon side of the Derwent, an area that's now part of Greater Hobart. They also settled here at New Norfolk, some 35 kilometres northwest of Hobart. There's a large newsprint works at New Norfolk, and it's also a centre for tourism. Close to the town is the grave of Betty King, who claimed to be the first white woman to set foot on Australian soil. Hobart could be reached from Rokeby by water, but the road linking New Norfolk to Hobart 
now called the Lyle Highway, wasn't completed until 1819, so for over 10 years it was very isolated. Norfolk Islanders also settled at Sandy Bay. The soil appeared to be reasonably good and it was only about four kilometres south of Hobart town. There was a good water supply from Sandy Bay Rivulet. However, this benign looking stream frequently became a raging torrent, interrupting transportation of crops. The beach here at Crayfish Point marks the approximate extent of those early land grants to the Norfolk Islanders. And sadly, they soon discovered that the land was unsuitable for growing grain, and some resettled to Rokeby and the area we now call Sorel. At Crayfish Point, you can visit the grave of James Batchelor, who died in 1810 aboard the Venus, a supply ship en route from Calcutta with emergency supplies of wheat for New South Wales. Later arrivals from Norfolk Island settled at Glenorchy and some 200 kilometres north of Hobart at Longford. The difficulty of making sometimes inferior land profitable meant that some ended up selling their land holdings for what they could get, eventually returning to a life of crime to survive. Thefts of stock and livestock, especially from isolated farmsteads, a constant problem, often blamed on the Aborigines. This bowling club stands on land that was granted to Norfolk Islanders in 1808. To ensure the spiritual needs of the convicts and settlers were not neglected, the Reverend Robert Knopwood accompanied Collins on the first voyage to Van Diemen's Land. This street on Battery Point is named after Knopwood and is where his house would have stood. He was granted land that extended down to the water's edge where this hotel now stands. This plaque on the subtel records Knopwood's story and recounts an argument he had with the authorities after Collins' death over ownership of his land. Battery Point is now the most valuable real estate in Hobart. Earliest church services were conducted under trees or in tents. It was some time before a church could be constructed, and when it was, in 1810, here at St David's Park, it doubled as a courthouse, a stable, and an occasional sleeping place for prisoners. It blew down in a gale a few months after it was constructed. The church was built in honour of David Collins, Van Diemen's Land's first Lieutenant Governor. He died suddenly in 1810. This is his memorial. There are a number of memorials to people who were important to Tasmania's history here at the park. It was the first cemetery and was placed here because it was some way from the settlement. Today it's part of the main city and it's surrounded by buildings it was first established for the burial of Elizabeth Edwards, the infant child of a free settler who died in April 1804. This memorial records the names of those earliest settlers and the ships they came on. The cemetery fell into disrepair and this memorial wall was erected to incorporate surviving headstones when the cemetery was renovated and opened as a park in 1926. As you can see, Many of the graves were for young children. Tragically, poor hygiene, contamination of the water supply and crude medical methods meant that diseases we read about now often killed the young and the elderly back then. What disease didn't do, accidents often did. Dealing with the sick and injured was an early priority and the first hospital that was not a tent was a simple wooden hut placed somewhere on the quay, probably where City Hall now stands. It had sufficient beds to treat 70 or 80 patients a year. Three surgeons arrived with the first settlers and they must have been kept very busy because in 1804 it rained for a whole month and many people became sick with scurvy, diarrhoea and chest infections. It was a harsh life. Within 16 months, one in 10 of settlers had died. Incredibly, the first proper hospital building 
wasn't built until 16 years later in 1820 on this site where the present Royal Hobart Hospital is located. Up to that date, patients were cared for in the wooden hut, supplemented when necessary by private houses and rented rooms. To defend the settlement and to be able to prepare appropriate welcomes for visitors, it was essential to have early warning of approaching ships and convicts were placed here on Betsy Island to man the first signal station. Druthy Point, close by, was where a whaling station was set up by Collins to harvest the whales and seals that populated the estuary. You won't see too many whales or seals now, but back then the estuary was said to house thousands of them. Education was not a high priority, but there was a potential living to be made by taking on the children of free settlers. The first attempt at this was a school established here in Collins Street in 1807 by Jane Knoll, a schoolmistress from Sydney. She didn't attract many customers though, and the venture didn't last very long. Hobart's first government grant aided school opened 10 years later in a house here in Davie Street. It included the children of prisoners and the poor, along with some wealthier students. We take law enforcement for granted today, but back then there was no police force as such. The law was consisted of decrees pronounced by the Lieutenant Governor and upheld, often inconsistently, by the military. Governor King never visited Van Diemen's Land. But in 1808, Governor Collins received an unexpected visit from King's successor, Governor Bly. Collins welcomed him with due ceremony and offered him a house to live in, but Bly described it as a poor, miserable shell and refused the offer. This wasn't the one that Bly refused to stay in, of course. This present government house was built many years later, in 1857. What Collins didn't know was that Bly had been forcibly removed from his position as Governor of New South Wales, and he'd only been allowed to sail for England on condition he went direct there. However, he took a detour via Van Diemen's Land and presented himself to Collins. Eventually, a letter arrived advising Collins that Bly was a fugitive from the law. Bly anchored his ship in the Derwent and refused to leave. He managed to get supplies of food smuggled to him from the shore. Now I'll show you a famous Hobart building that's connected to this story. This is Ingle Hall. It's significant in this story because John Ingle, who owned the house, was a successful merchant who was reputed to have secretly sold rice to Bly whilst his ship was at anchor. Ingle Hall has another connection to those earliest days in that it houses the Hobart Mercury newspaper's print museum. The first newspaper in Van Diemen's Land was in 1810 at Lieutenant Collins' instigation. It had the rather grand title of Derwent Star and Van Diemen's Land Intelligencer. Unfortunately, it was unable to pay its way and closed after a few months. Six years later, the Hobart Town Gazette and Southern Reporter had more success, lasting some five years. The Mercury has been in operation since 1854. For some years, Hobart Town, or Hobarton, as it was originally called, was mainly a penal colony with free settlers farming on the outskirts of the town. By 1810, when Collins died, there were about 1,300 people living in and around Hobart, some still in tents, and some in simple dwellings, such as this one, owned by George Harris, a surveyor and naturalist who arrived with Collins. As these contemporary sketches show, it hardly justified being called a town. Governor Macquarie, who'd been sent out to replace Bly, didn't visit this part of New South Wales until 1811, and he wasn't very impressed either with the random layout of the town or with the quality of many of the simple dwellings. He arranged for the Surveyor General to draw up plans for the town and published an order to the effect that all future buildings had to conform to this plan. The names that Macquarie gave to streets and their basic layout still remain to this day. <laughs> 
This is a copy made in the 1840s and it shows the original plan in red with later additions superimposed. He also gave orders for a signal station to be set up here at the top of Mount Nelson. The Marine Board of Hobart established the current signal station to commemorate that event. It contains a small museum related to marine signalling. It took some time for many of the buildings and facilities Macquarie wanted to be realised. One of the problems was the lack of a skilled workforce. The other were ever-growing bands of bushrangers who threatened the town and made any sort of development more difficult than it needed to be. However, Governor Macquarie's visit marked the point when the transformation of the settlement into something recognisable as a permanent town really started. In 1812, Hobart was made the administrative capital of Van Diemen's Land. Post office was opened in 1813 on the same site where this current post office is located. Despite these milestone developments, a shortage and skilled labour, poor administration, rampant crime and lack of support from the mainland made progress very slow. However, things changed dramatically when, in 1817, William Sorrell was appointed governor. Sorrell was a brilliant administrator, and within a few months, he turned Hobart around from being a rough, disorderly settlement into a prosperous town. By 1820, when this engraving was made, Hobart was a flourishing township. And with the town properly established, our story about the founding of Hobart comes to an end. Here are some of the key locations mentioned in this program about Hobart. New Norfolk, where Norfolk Islanders settled and where Betty King's grave can be seen. The Bowen Bridge that now connects Risdon to the mainland. Newtown, where officers lived. Risdon Cove, where Bowen and his party landed to establish the first settlement. Bowen Park, part of the land that was returned to the Aborigines in 1995 and where Bowen's memorial stands. Rokeby, where some of the Norfolk Islanders established farms. Crayfish Point, the extent of land granted to Norfolk Islanders and where the grave of Jane's bachelor can be seen. Mount Nelson. Druthy Point, where a whaling station was set up by Collins. Betsy Island, where the first signal station was placed. Anglesey Barracks, the oldest continuously occupied barracks in Australia. St David's Park, where Collins and other historic memorials can be found. Knopwood Street, named after Reverend Robert Knopwood. The Knopwood Retreat Hotel. Salamanca Place, where you can find the Tasman Fountain. City Hall. The Royal Hobart Hospital, where the first proper hospital building was erected. Ingle Hall, where the Mercury offices and print museum are housed. The General Post Office. The Town Hall, where the second government house was built. Franklin Square, previously Barrack Square, site of the first government house. The Cenotaph, close to where the Hobart Town Rivulet now enters the Derwent. Hunter's Island, where stores were held. Franklin Wharf, where the Lady Nelson docks. The Grand Chancellor Hotel, the spot where Collins probably first landed and raised the British flag. <laughs>